base of the heart having the major vessels, and then the apex of the heart is actually at the top. And we see that it's some of it is center, and a lot of it is over to the left. Name the sac surrounding the heart. Pericardium. And it show, the picture shows a normal pericardium where you've got a sac around the heart and there's very little fluid in the sac, just enough so that heart movement can occur. However, a lot of fluid can accumulate in the sac, and when it does, it's called a pericardial effusion. sac, it's called pericardial effusion. And when you have a lot of fluid in the sac and it surrounds the heart, it actually prevents the heart from filling with blood and then contracting and, and um, ejecting the blood from the heart. So the issue with fluid accumulating in the sac is that it will compress the heart and prevent blood from filling the heart and also prevent blood from being ejected. Should I give you a second to write all of it down? Say it one more time. Yeah. Um, so there's a, a sac around the heart. It's called a pericardial sac. And there's different situations where fluid will accumulate in the pericardial sac. And when fluid accumulates in the sac, it will compress the heart. And when it compresses the heart, there will be less blood to come into the heart to fill it. And therefore, less blood will leave the heart and the heart contracts. Question? So is that the same as pericarditis? Um, no, that would be inflammation of the lining, not necessarily fluid in the sac. So it is prevent blood in and out? Yes. Yeah, since there's less blood coming in, there will be less blood going out. It's almost like taking your fist and then squeezing it. You wouldn't be able to get much blood in there. Therefore, not much blood in the You have a question? No, um, just moving. Um, you said when the heart contracts, so that's what it's coming in and then less blood is coming in. Yes. Yeah. Um, so the, the less blood coming into the heart and less blood going out has another name. It's called cardiac tamponade. Um, so fluid pressing on the heart prevents adequate blood flow, that's cardiac tamponade. So fluid pressing on the heart prevents normal blood flow, that's what cardiac tamponade is. Yes. What did I say? Um, fluid pressing on the heart. Fluid. Cardiac tamponade. <laughs> pressing on the heart. Surrounding the heart um, will compress the heart and prevent normal blood flow. And that's called cardiac tamponade. Question? What's the difference between the two? The pericardial effusion is referring to the fluid, and the fact that you have very low um, cardiac output or very low blood flow is the cardiac tamponade. Wait, what? So the prevention of the normal blood flow is the cardiac tamponade, and then the pericardial effusion is the fluid. Yes. Okay. Oh, so fluid and then the heart is the blood. Yes. Okay, okay, Dr. Okay. Does that like happen with, let's say, congestive heart failure? No, usually with heart surgery, when patients come back from open heart surgery, it's possible during the surgery that uh, there's a tear or something and the fluid starts accumulating in that sac. Trauma can cause it also. So trauma to the chest can also cause fluid <coughs> to get into that sac.
Yes, it can be drained. So I have a question. Sure. So this cardiac um, temp, does that happen? Does that happen inside more of outside than like inside of the blood? Basically, that's what you're saying. Um, the tamponade is the squeezing of the heart. So pericardial effusion will lead to cardiac tamponade. And this is the that in the The pericardial effusion is the fluid in the sac. Yes. So they kind of go hand in hand, and you just have to know how to use them in the sac. What is the definition of a pericardial effusion? Fluid pressure on the heart that prevents normal. Yeah, it's fluid that accumulates in the pericardial sac. go to the chambers of the heart. And we start off with the atria, and the atria are called the collecting chambers because they receive blood from some major vessels. They're called the collecting chambers. The right atrium collects deoxygenated blood, which is returned from the body through the superior and inferior vena cava. Oh, let's find the picture. We want to see the right atrium. So the right atrium is collecting blood that's flowing from the superior vena cava, draining into the right atrium, and then coming up from the lower body, the inferior vena cava, and it will drain into the right atrium. The left atrium collects oxygenated blood, which is returned from the lungs through the pulmonary vein. the left atrium and the blood that arrives in the left atrium is bringing the freshly oxygenated blood back from the lungs. Do you know why they're called pulmonary veins if they've got freshly oxygenated blood in them? Does that go to them? Very good. So any vessels going to the heart are considered veins. It actually doesn't have anything to do with whether there's oxygenated blood or deoxygenated blood. It's a vessel bringing blood to the heart. It's considered a vein. And then a vessel taking blood away from the heart is considered an artery. So pretty much most arteries have oxygenated blood, and most veins have deoxygenated blood. So the exceptions are the vessel that leaves the right ventricle and goes to the lungs, pulmonary artery has deoxygenated blood. That's the blood that returned from the body without oxygen, and now it's going to be sent to the lungs. So it has deoxygenated blood, but it's still called the pulmonary artery. So now do you understand why something is called an artery, something is called a vein? So an artery is any vessel taking blood away from the heart. A vein is any vessel bringing the blood back to the heart. Okay, the next chambers are the ventricles. The right ventricle pumps blood through the pulmonary arteries to the alveoli in the lungs so that the blood can receive oxygen and give up carbon dioxide. The left ventricle pumps blood out through the aorta to all areas of the body. Um, this feeds the organs of the body with a fresh supply of oxygen. 
And when we're looking at a picture and we're talking to the right, because the picture is opposite of us, the right is actually our left, and the left is actually our right. So looking on the left side, we see the right ventricle, again, because it's opposite us. And when blood pumps and leaves the right ventricle, it's going into the pulmonary artery. Remember, that's deoxygenated blood that has to travel to the lungs to pick up oxygen. Then when the blood comes back from the lungs, it goes into the left side of the heart. It will go from the left atrium into the left ventricle. And when the heart contracts, it will push the blood from the left ventricle into the aorta and to the rest of the body. So which side of the heart has the freshly oxygenated blood? The right or the left? The left. The left. The left. Now we have to know the names of the valves. It says the tricuspid valve is located between the right atrium and the right ventricle. Um, the tricuspid valve will open when the ventricle relaxes and it will close when the ventricle begins to contract. All right, tricuspid valve good. Right, we're looking for the valve that goes between the right atrium and the right ventricle. Did you find the tricuspid valve? Yeah. So when the valve is open, it's going to let the right ventricle fill with blood. Tricuspid valve. The way I remember the name is T-R-I, R-I for right. How do oh, you remember try before you try? Try before you buy, what does that say? So you, you have to go try, then you buy. So the try is before the buy on the left. Oh, okay. Got it. Like we missed one. We did. Um, next is the pulmonic valve, and that's located between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery. It'll open when the ventricle contracts, and it'll close when pressure in the pulmonary artery exceeds pressure in the ventricle. So the pulmonic valve, <coughs> pardon me, is pushed open. So when the heart contracts and squeezes the blood, um, that contraction pushes these valves open. So nothing has to happen for these valves to open. They'll just feel the pressure, the, the high pressure of blood in the ventricle, and they'll just be pushed open. When there's a lot of blood ahead of them, it kind of pushes the valve shut. So there's no, no muscles that have to contract. The valves just work on their own. Which is, the body is amazing, isn't it? Right? And then the last two valves, the mitral valve, is located between the left atrium and the left ventricle. And this is what you're calling the bicuspid valve? All right. So in your anatomy class, it's called the bicuspid valve. And if you're working in the open heart unit and you're getting the report on your patient coming out of OR, it's, it's a mitral valve replacement. You won't hear them say the bicuspid valve was replaced. It's called the mitral valve when you're at the bedside. So um, bicuspid, mitral valve, same valve. It's the valve between the left atrium and the left ventricle. Um, and then next is the aortic valve. It's located between the left ventricle and the aorta. It'll open when the left ventricle contracts, <coughs> and then it'll close when pressure in the aorta is higher than pressure in the ventricle. So we see the mitral valve open. So when it's open, that's when the blood can enter the left ventricle. And then when the ventricle, or when the heart contracts, it's going to push the valve closed. But then the aortic valve opens, and the blood will be delivered to the aorta. Mm -hmm. the Trace the flow of blood 
from the inferior vena cava through the heart, mention the name of each <coughs> valve that you pass. Who would like to volunteer to do this? We'll start with the inferior vena cava or superior vena cava and trace the flow of blood. Would you like to go? Um, yeah. Okay. I think. Okay, so it goes from the um, superior vena cava down into the right upper ventricle, um, atrium, and then it goes down, it passes through the um, tricuspid, and then down to the lower right atrium, up into the right ventricle. ventricle. It, it, yeah. And then, <laughs> yeah, no, forget it. <laughs> We can help you. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> you want to go? I'll try. Okay. Equals, you want to start with the inferior vena cava? It goes to both, right? Yeah. The superior superior vena, vena cava drains, inferior vena cava drains. Into the right atrium. Okay. Into the tricuspid valve to the right ventricle. Okay. And then through the, I'm going to say, um, the pulmonary, the yeah. pulmonary semi lunar valve. Very good. To the lungs, where gas exchange occurs. Yes. And then back through the veins, through the arteries. Through back through the pulmonary veins. Right in the pulmonary veins. Okay. To the left atrium. Very good. Then the micro valve, through the left ventricle. Okay. And through the, the aortic semi lunar valve. Okay. Good job! All right. Um, so go through that over and over again so you're ready for the test for next week. All right, so here's a picture. It's showing you two pictures, actually. It wants you to say which view shows systole. Systole is when the heart is contracting. Diastole is when the heart is relaxing. So this is systole. That means the heart is contracting. And it shows the, the valves. We've got the valves between the atria and the ventricles are open here, but the pulmonic and aortic valves are closed. So what do you think is happening here? Very good. All right, so here with the AV valves open, then you know that the ventricles are filling and that's diastole. It's the cycle of the heart where the ventricles are filling with blood and you can tell because the valves are open. So yeah. that's diastole, which leaves this one to be systole. When the heart contracts, it pushes the AV valves shut, but then the pulmonic and aortic, pulmonic and aortic valve open as blood leaves the heart. Phenomenal. 